Welcome to Ink and Magic, a podcast where we read and discuss the writing craft, world building, and romance of paranormal and fantasy novels. If you love books with bite, set in worlds of magic and mayhem, then you're in the right place. My name's Nikisha Shane. I go by an S. And I'm Leslie. I write as Elle Penelope. And welcome to the show. Welcome, everybody, to episode one of Ink and Magic. Today, we are going to be doing a deep dive into the book Slave to Sensation by Nalini Singh. It is the first entry, first official full length entry in the Side Changeling series. We're going to dive right in with spoilers up front. So, if you haven't read it, if you don't want spoilers, come back and join us when you have. Or if you're one of those people who don't care about spoilers, yeah, keep listening. That's a good point that this isn't the very, this is the first book. But it's not the first story in the Fly Changeling world. And some of them, most of these came after the books were published. I haven't the, even like, read some of the point oh five and the point oh sevens. Yeah, the prequels. And the, she has a lot of short stories. <laughs> if you're on the Lini Singh's newsletter, she's always giving you extra content, extra material. It's and so if you're looking up the series, me. yeah, on Goodreads, you'll see all of these in-betweens. So... Yeah, we are focusing on the main books right now. We might go back and do some of the extra we stories. Are, we, we are going to go back and do some of the extra stories because there are some tropes that we want to talk about. We're just we're going to start in, or, in the order right, right now. And these are rereads for both of us. But mm -hmm. I haven't I, I've read this first book several times, but not in many years. So it was kind of new to me again. I, it's been long enough so that I kind of forgot. And it's the wonder of experiencing it again is great. Isn't that an interesting phenomenon? Especially thank you, Goodreads, for coming into existence because this was also a way when we were living further apart, when Leslie and I were living further apart from each other, this was another way that we kind of stayed in touch was on Goodreads. We mm -hmm. would read each other's Goodreads reviews and comment right. on each other's Goodreads reviews. But now when I go back and I read this book 10 plus years later, gosh, it was a little while ago, I forgot so much. I just knew Sasha. And Lucas. Yeah. But I could not remember a single, other than the biting. I remembered the biting. Really? And I remembered the dream love scenes. That was it. I didn't remember anything else. Yeah, I don't, I didn't remember much of anything either. And then so as as you reread, things come back to you a little bit, but like the airy and things like that. But yeah, yeah it was still still brand new. So the first book, we're introduced up front to Silence. This, now, the whole series takes place in sort of an alternate Earth, in alternate San Francisco Bay Area, or the larger, in 2079. And there's the existence of three three races, humans, changelings, who are animal shifters, and psi, who are humans with psychic powers and various you know designations of psychic powers. And she starts the series with sort of a prologue telling you the background of silence, but it's fascinating. It's, it's like an info dump, but not because it's actually, you need the information and it's a really elegant way of actually getting it through. We talk a lot about info dumping as writers and not wanting to, but sometimes it's the most efficient way to get it done. And if it's interesting and has tension in it, then it works. And I think this prologue really worked. Yeah. I'm one of those that I don't like a prologue either, but I, again, I think it's because of my training where especially we were both trained as poor film students. <laughs> and if you were going to shoot a scene, you better use that scene because you had to pay for the film. You had to pay to get it developed. So you were going to figure out how to we, use it. We were in film school when it was on film on and film. <laughs> that you had to get developed. And then we were cutting it with razors. While eating uh, ramen. <laughs> so not to, well, not to date cut it with razors. Razor. I didn't get that far in, in, in the program. <laughs> Oh, right. Yes. I, cu I cut audio with razors and film with razors. And then the videotape was the, you know, two VCRs with the yes, controller. That was me. That's where I was. Those videotape was cheaper. That's one yes. of the reasons. Not really. Film was expensive. <laughs> one of the reasons Developing, was processing, expensive. Expensive. But, right. So prologues, I'm always very, that's one of, that is the reason that I'm always very hesitant to do a prologue. I'm like, do you really need this? Can you can you weave this in somewhere else? And I think Singh made a really great decision because we really needed to understand because the first time that we meet our heroine, Sasha, it's she's talking about she's feeling and that is so dangerous. And we know it's dangerous for her because we just learned about this silence protocol. And the silence was instituted because the side, their, their emotions were starting, or, or so they believe their emotions were starting to make them kill and harm people. So they instituted the silence to get rid of emotions, thinking that that's going to just wipe out this problem. They have of serial killers and psychopaths, right. but it doesn't. 
Right. And we see that in this first book because it's all about you know, the external plot is the hunt for a serial killer who is Psy. And I think it's interesting that you have the races split up. We don't spend any time with humans in these first couple of books, mm -hmm. but you've got the Psy who are, because they have dampened or erased all of their emotions, they go through this protocol as children to wipe them out. They are head-based and they are robotic and cold and unfeeling. And then the changelings are animals. They're all heart and touch and, you know, emotion and the, the very, the Set juxtaposition. Up the opposites attract. Yeah. The perfect opposites attract set up for so many books. It's a great world building element that you give yourself natural conflict in the world that perpetuates the character growth and the plot. And I talk about that a lot in world building and teaching world building. Like, how does the world support every other element of the story? Like how, you know, this story couldn't take place in any other world. And it's all so tightly woven and integrated that makes it really great. Leslie, that's so interesting that you say that that all the uh, all the elements of the, the world that play into the story because think about Lucas and Sasha meet because Lucas wants to build um, um, apartments right. and the houses. They, right. That's why they come together as a business deal. Sasha's mother and Lucas and his pack, they want to work together to build um, these complexes. But one of the reasons that they're come that the Psy are coming to the changelings is because They've tried before to build developments for changelings. The Psy have tried to build developments for the changelings, and the changelings were not interested at all because it did these these dwellings did not suit who the changelings were as mm -hmm. beings. They weren't yeah. like the Aries. They were in these cold, sterile buildings, and the changelings were like, "No, nah, I'm not living in there." <laughs> yeah, and I, I I like really relate to that just because. In looking for houses and places to live, even as a regular person in the real world, it's like some places feel cold and oh, all that modern, you know, the, the marble and the glass. I'm like, I don't want to live there. I want to live in a vintage, like 1930s bungalow. You know? Or she do less me. <laughs> that's what I feel like the changelings are like. Like, what is the version of the changeling 1930s bungalow? Oh, God. <laughs> but that's that. That is the reason that um, Sasha and her mother, Nikita, go to Lucas is to try to partner and do it better because they're thinking in their mind, they just want profit. But right. Sasha, again, Sasha walks in and she wakes up and she's freaked out. Another feeling. She's freaked out because she's feeling she wakes up whimpering, Nolini writes in the in, in her opening episode. And it's also very interesting, too, that when we get the description of Lucas, He's described as a man and a predator. I loved that mm -hmm. he was already introduced mm -hmm. as a paranormal being. And so chapter one, the hook, you know, the hook is where you figure out what's the problem before the problem. You know, it has the inciting incident of the ultimate script hasn't happened. That first thing that sets them off on the journey. But we know that Sasha is afraid. She knows that if she's discovered as being abnormal in any way, she will be uh, basically mentally killed. I mean, she's a, it's going to be turned into a zombie, I think is how she- will be rehabilitated, yeah. Rehabilitated, right. So we know she's worried, she's abnormal. We get Lucas's hook, you know, he wants to catch the killer. He has, you know, secrets, but he has his motivation that we find out later. The stakes are set and it is a really great way to hook us into the world and their stories and their characters because we feel immediately for both of them. And so when we, so after this meeting where Lucas is kind of pushing up against Sasha, she gets home she, and she shuts down during the meeting because she knows that she's feeling and she doesn't want to be found out. But when she gets home, she sits and she, she lists all the things that she felt, which is interesting. But then mm. she goes to sleep and she dreams of Lucas. And in her dreams, she allows herself to do whatever she wants to do with this man, Black <laughs> Changeling, which I found really fascinating because uh, I have been reading a lot of bodice rippers and old school romance for a reason, not important, but I've been <laughs> doing that. And w the pattern in these bodice rippers is that women because these, these books were written in the in the early 70s and it was a time of sexual repression for some women couldn't they couldn't express their sexual desires or they would be considered whores so in these books written by these women of the time the man had to take initiative they had to force her into it then it's not her fault 
Because then the next time that it happens, she might like it a little bit, but it's okay. Because he is the one that initiated it, which again, I'm not a psychiatrist. So this is just <laughs> what happened. <laughs> but in, um, but it was really interesting to me. This book was put out in 2006. Yeah. So this, so we're still in, we're still having some effects of this era, but we've gotten far enough away. But this dreams, this, these dream lover, that trope was really interesting to me that Singh used that because it, I felt like it was another way for this cold, non-feeling being who was not supposed to enjoy, who was not supposed to enjoy period for her to, to, to explore her sensual side. Mm -hmm. Little did she know <laughs> these dreams were actually real. Well, they were connected. They were both having the same dream. She thinks that she's just dreaming of him. He thinks he's dreaming of her. And soon, he, I think he realizes at first that these are actually like lucid dreams where they're both mm -hmm. dreaming of each other. And yeah, that's interesting to, to connect it to the bodice rippers because I think early 2000s, we're out of that time. We're in more of the modern era, I, I would say, of, yeah. of romance. Although, you know, when we get to book two, we'll talk more about that because it's a theme that comes back. Um, but for, for Sasha, it's like, this, this is the only place where it's safe. And I think she thinks, or she says in there that if she gets this out of her system, that whole romance trope of, let me just do it once to get it out of my system. <laughs> let me do it in my dreams and then I'll be okay. And I'll come back and nobody will ever know. And that never, ever works for anybody, it but work. it's something that I guess we love to read because we're to keep writing it over and over again. Um, and I was struck also by sort of Sasha and the side dilemma of, they're born for specific jobs. You know, the Psy uh, community or their whole race is very commerce focused. Mm -hmm. You know, these families come together for, for profit. And ultimately, we find out a lot of things are allowed to continue for profit reasons. Mm -hmm. And so there's something that is a trope overall in speculative fiction about being born to do a specific job and taken to extremes in, in other stories where there's like literally clones who are only born for this and alien races who are created in test tubes for this and that. And, you know, that comes to play here with this eye, I think. And if she can't do the job she's meant to do, then she can be destroyed or, you know, in other, other ones will be like farmed out for parts or something. It's very, it's it's gross. It's like the, the the terminology that is used, you know, it's dehumanizing on purpose. And then to have this respite from this dehumanizing world that they exist in, in the sensuality of the dream, and then overall being thrust into the sensuality of the changing world is such a culture shock, but also so, you know, something she never dreamed that she could want. And it gets to the the fantasy of romance. It's like I think a lot of people you know, the readers will be like, oh, well, can I have this, this touch is so such the, um, the most dominant sense in this book, everything is touch. And I thought that was really unusual, because it done really well, because a lot of times, the senses that you use as a writer that you see in books, is a lot of visual visual senses or hearing, sometimes smells, but incorporating smells is something that people do less frequently. And in romance, obviously, we have touch, but it's just so overwhelming in this book and so described so lushly in so many different ways. Just that, that touch is just like a neon sign was on it for the whole thing for me. Yeah, because they had the changelings, you had to have skin privileges in order to get really close to them. And it became a plot point of Sasha getting and also giving skin mm -hmm. privileges for Lucas and for other people in his pack, which brings up an interesting dynamic. There's two things that I want to hop on about what you said. One is this you, where you were talking about how they're born for jobs. And I we all talk about found family in romance, where there's people that aren't necessarily blood that come together and they form a pack. There's a pack in this book with the changelings. But I thought that with the the sigh, they are, they weren't found family, even though they they don't necessarily go to their parents. They go to these different family groups, depending upon what um, job that they're doing. But it was more like a forced family. And I thought that was interesting. And it, it doesn't always feel right to be to be forced into these bonds. But in addition to that, you know how we talk about competence porn in yeah. romance where someone um, is the best at their job. Right. Sasha 
was born a cardinal and you know that you're a cardinal, a cardinal side, which is like the pinnacle, you're the strongest, most powerful side of whatever classification you are. You know that you are because your eyes are like, it looks like the night sky with stars. Mm -hmm. And that's what her, her eyes look like. However, she believes that her cardinal powers never manifested, but we're going to learn that she just, that they just killed off what her powers actually are. The silence just silenced them. Because her powers had to completely do with feeling and emotion. I don't think we're going out of order too much, but we'll learn that Sasha is an empath. An empath is someone who can take the the emotions from you and take them unto herself and help you to feel better. That's, that's, that is the worst power that you can have as a sigh under silence. I mean, they don't even know it exists. They've never heard of this e side designation. Everyone's like, that's, that's not a real thing uh-huh. because they erased it from their history. They've been under silence for 100 years at this point. Mm-hmm. And so you know, everyone alive does not remember this. And it was wiped out of her, which is why at the beginning she feels broken. Something's wrong because she's been suppressing this part of herself. I, I did want to go to the, the forced family. Because it made me think of just having a corporate job or any job that you might not like. You're, you know, you have your work family, um, whether you like them or not. You know, mm-hmm. you could love your job, but your work family is sort of like that forced family. And the idea that the Psy version of family is a corporation, essentially. You know, we have Nikita is Sasha's mother, but she's also the head of the company, and everything is based on, like I said before, the commerce. This idea of transactional relationships and coldness um, is, I guess, you could draw parallels with capitalism and, you know, how do we value people and what do the side value? And so, yeah, this forced family is a really cool way to put it. Um, that is something that we can also relate to as regular people because we get forced to deal with the people that work even though we may not want to. <laughs> so you were talking about this need for, for, for touch and how that sense is over, is, is, is portrayed a great deal in these books and the idea of skin privileges, but I also think that there might have something to do with being touch starved. Now, if we're talking about um, uh, beats, I think we're probably close to or at the fun and game beats at this point. Yeah. I think once you're in the dream sex part of it, which is chapter <laughs> five, you're in fun and games. So you've established their motive, their, their desires. You know, Sasha needs this deal to go well. Lucas is infiltrating the Psy to catch this killer, the Psy killer who is killing changelings and doing it secretively. And you have set up the stakes for both of them, the internal stakes. So now we're in fun and games. The dream sex, they're getting to know each other. They're touching more. The, the romance beats are escalating. Yeah, so the fun and games portion of a romance is when they're falling in love. It's kind of the evidence of them falling in love. I always say, because, you know, films, television, roots, it's that montage, like Think Dirty Dancing, when uh, Johnny and Baby were like learning that she was teaching her to dance and it was like set to, um, I can't remember the name of the song right now, but it, it was her like bopping around, walking up and down the steps and he's doing the overhead lift in the water. Oh, the name of the song is going to come to me. I know people are screaming at me right now. But all of the fun and games has to do with kind of a a push-pull getting to know you. Uh, There's a great video on YouTube with this woman named Lisa Daly talking about the three dates and the disaster. I love that analogy. But all of Sasha and Lucas's dates have to deal with skin privileges and being touch starved. And yes, some of those happen in the dream, but also when she goes to his airy, that's, and she's, I love when she meets Tamsin, the healer of Lucas's pack. Sasha identifies, she makes a point to identify what she's feeling when she sees Lucas and Tamsin touch. And she identifies it as jealousy. It's the first time she's felt jealousy. And I thought that was fantastic. Right. Yeah. You you sense that jealousy within her and her discomfort with it, but it's there. Like that, and that's these are the normal beats of the romance taking place. She's like, who is that? Why is she touching him? And you know, she's fighting with herself. Exactly. Yeah. Um, also when she, I think, I'm not sure if it's that that scene or not, but I her internal conflict of always feeling alone. And doesn't not fitting in anywhere and feeling like she's broken. And then she's around these people who all seem to fit together and they touch each other so casually and they're just giving each other the thing that she feels like she needs, even though she doesn't want to need it. Yeah. And that just that's another thing of like raising the stakes yeah. um, and just digging the hole deeper. So we're kind of 
two steps forward, one step back in terms of the emotional growth and progress. But yeah, it's kind of heartbreaking. The jealousy is fun from a romance perspective, but it's also driving home all of the, the issues that 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 uh, Sasha is having. So the jealousy happens in that scene, but also another thing happens in that scene. She has chocolate chip cookies for the first time. Right. right? Yes. And, you know, of course I picked that up because of chocolate chip cookies, but it's also, it's, it's other senses. So she, she's been feeling, but she's also now she's, she's touched. And now she's also tasted something Tasting, where nutrition yeah. has always been for her. I just need to eat enough protein, eat enough protein, eat enough nutri nutrients, to to fulfill that role, but now she's having pleasure. Mm -hmm. That's why they don't have chocolate. She's never had chocolate because it's no nutritional value in chocolate. Why would we have that? It's not yeah, illogical. Ever, they're wrong. <laughs> 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 we need carbs. Yes, <laughs> human need carbs. Right. So also, um, we also start to see as Sasha is feeling the jealousy. We also start to see Lucas as possessive and as territorial. So even though he, um, even though he's giving her touch skin privileges and she's slowly allowing him some he doesn't like it when anyone else in his pack is getting too close to her either yeah that jealousy rears its head both ways and then it kind of goes toward his internal conflict of needing to protect this woman who he's growing to care for and eventually he'll realize that he loves her and so we learn about we learned about his wound you know his character wound which is the thing in the past that sort of creates the motivation in the present. So Lucas had this terrible tragedy happen. His parents were killed. He wasn't able to protect them. He tried hard. He was injured. He was near death himself. And that that's why he's trying to catch this killer to protect his pack. He is the alpha of the pack. So he needs to protect everyone. And then Sasha becomes thought of by him and his animal as his to protect. Mm -hmm. So that you know moves that forward it's not just jealousy it's like she you know as he opens to the realization that she belongs to him that she's his mate eventually he'll know that he knows initially that whatever for whatever reason he needs to protect this woman and he can't let anyone else be a victim under his watch again i've been studying alphas too along with bodice rivers i've been studying alphas and one of the things that i find really interesting at, at alphas um, especially the bodice ripper type alphas is that a lot of times their their need to protect and their need to be so possessive comes from a wound of their past. And Leslie nailed it where he had a horrendous event happen in his past with the death of his family. And that keeps that that, that specifically doesn't surface, but the result of that surfaces with him being super protective and needing to mark his territory, establish his boundaries, and better not nobody cross these, even my found family. Right. right. Yeah. He, he feels some type of way about members of his pack getting too close. And that's going to be echoed down the line in the series. And I think that's one of the things just in general with shifter romance, where you know, we have these super alpha, like literal alphas um, of these packs. And this is a, a leopard pack, which is actually an unusual animal. We haven't yeah. talked much about that. I guess we're used to seeing wolves and even bears, but a leopard pack. In my head, he's a wolf. Because I'm just like, a leopard? Right? <laughs> I, I do wonder why she chose that animal. So the, the two packs we talk about, we meet in this first book, are the leopard pack, Dark River, and... Um, is that is it Dark River? Yeah, and then the the wolves, the snow snow dancers, snow dancers. Snow dancers. Yeah, okay. so, I know. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I just read this book, but um, and and wolves. Yeah, we see wolves all the time. Wolves are very popular animals for paranormal romance. But leopards, I love cats. I mean, I think it's cool and it's something a little bit different. And I would just would love to know why why leopards. Um, I'm wondering because. This has been in my head for a while, and I have no idea. You know, sometimes stuff gets in my head, and I have no idea where it comes from. But I think I remember her talking about biting mm. and the biting. There's so much biting that happens in here, <laughs> and a lot of times, a lot of times in paranormal romance, it's really sexy, like because the bite is the mark that right. claims you right. as as that changelings as the mate. Yeah, but this was a lot of sexual biting, and I'm not trying to king shame. <laughs> But I realized that that's not my kink. Biting is not my kink. Like a biting bite my mark, kink. but not biting. Play. Yeah. Like in general, you know, 
the anything that sounds painful is not going to be my kink either. <laughs> but I can suspend disbelief and you know understand that the the changing the animals need to do that and you know the, the scenes her we can talk about the the sex scenes i guess now mm -hmm. or the midpoint right is mm -hmm. it the midpoint yeah i know what chapter it is uh, often sex is at the midpoint their real life non-dream version of sex when they actually consummate is how nalini singh writes it i feel like it's more like lushly written than written to be like super hot it ends up being hot but in a very writerly way more so than some other you know she's not trying for something erotic necessarily but she is very descriptive and we're in the pov and again the touch senses the domination of that that sense sensory description language um it makes it almost more poetic to me than mm. anything else mm. You just reminded me of something. I remember because we were talking a little bit about the senses and and the sense of smell. And one of my favorite parts of this book is when Lucas tells Sasha the reason that he knows that the serial killer is Psy is because Psy's have a metallic stink. Yes, and she will not let it go. She's like, <laughs> I stink. I stink. <laughs> <laughs> she will not let it go. Right. I mean, imagine this guy you like tells you you stink. Like, how would you feel? <laughs> that sounds awful. Yes. But in addition to um, Nalini's grasp, wonderful grasp of sex scenes, I really started to pay attention to what she was talking about, how, how really she was talking about pack rules. And I think that we can learn a lot from, as authors, from the rules that she starts to to just put on the page that I'm just kind of writing down as, oh, this must be a rule. When she, she, and it's that, that sense of smell and the, the shifter will want his mate or whoever he is about to claim to smell like him. And that's another mm -hmm. reason I was talking about the mortal, the, the, the metal stink. Oh There's, yeah. Right. There's also a mating dance that happens. And I think, and with what Singh starts to do is with the leopards they know what the dance looks like and they know when someone is, is in that mating dance and the other males start to back up because they, because of that territorialness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's just, it's not just the alphas. It's all males. I'm staking my claim. This is, she is part of my boundary, part of my territory and y'all need to back up. And Tamsin recognizes this early on mm -hmm. and she's all for it. You know, there's no, <laughs> it's funny because I guess you have that. She's the healer. She's an empathetic character. Um, there's not that. Why were you falling for a sigh? You know, you're the <laughs> alpha. how are you going to bring this sigh into our midst? Mm -hmm. She's like down from day one. She's like, she's my friend. Mm -hmm. I like her. I don't care that she's a sigh. You know, something's obviously going on with this woman that she's having some kind of struggle and Tamsin welcomes her. But I think there's tiny elements of other females in the, in the, um, in the pack who are like mm -hmm. not so welcoming. Um, but I just, I liked that oh, Sasha yeah. has somebody down for her. Was it Rena or? Yeah. I the name of the character. Yeah, I believe that was her. But you know what's interesting? Yeah, that's, those are the only two women that we meet. Like we don't meet the pack full. Yeah. We meet the Sentinels, the yes. ones who are basically his um, guards. Mm -hmm. We meet um, Tamsin. Mm-hmm. And yet, but Kit is kind of like in, in because he's the alpha in training. He's the alpha in waiting. So there's this younger alpha yeah. that they, they can sense it on him. This guy, this kid's going to be something. But we also meet um, Tamsin's two cubs. Yes. Which is the cutest thing between the, the cubs relationship with Sasha. Right. As they're like chewing her boot. And she knows not, she doesn't want to get them in trouble. So she hides the damage. <laughs> right. And like, no, Psy would ever do that, but she allows it to happen. Mm -hmm. And she's very, yeah, that's her whole breakdown of, is and it I, maternal instincts coming through or just, ooh, just the empathy? Yeah. That's a good point. But what another thing that Singh does is she uses those boots more than once. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. When, when um, the Sasha puts them on again. Something yes. that is flawed as she's starting to have her breakdown, she yeah. puts the boots on again when she's going to meet with other side. I, I think she she didn't realize she had them on. Like she's scared when she realizes this is evidence of my breakdown. This is a, something that they could get me for and rehabilitate me for. Yeah. Which makes me realize we haven't talked about the villain of the story at all yet. Oh yeah. So sure. there is an external plot, although <laughs> ultimately 
we, Nalini Singh is not super concerned no. about the external plot. No, like no, no, no. there is, you know, the size serial killer who they are searching for. And she eventually realizes she can't protect her people. She realizes that her, the council has been protecting a serial killer that knows about it as she goes and helps Lucas investigate. She's the only one who can get into the Cynet, which is their mental internet to, you know, investigate and research and try to try to get information to stop this killing. And so we have Enrique. What was his I can't name? remember his last name either. But he's Enrique. Enrique. Yes. And, you know, he is, he's brought in as an antagonist early on. He's a powerful size on the council and he's, he wants something from her and she doesn't know why it feels unusual. And he's, he's after her and every, and she's afraid because she's having this breakdown. She's having this reaction to being around the changelings. And so she knows he's going to sniff it out. She's afraid her mother's going to sniff it out. She's very powerful. Mm -hmm. And Enrique is going to sniff it out. And so there's one point where she's wearing the shoes and she, Enrique is there and she's like, he's definitely going to know. And she's trying to hide her, mm -hmm. hide her feet. And, you know, this the metaphor of hiding her literal brokenness. You know, her, her shoe is broken and she is broken too. Yeah. So Enrique, um, the way he's profiling, he's mostly profiling humans and changelings. But then he starts and, to profile. Go ahead. I just like, you know, Enrique ends up being the serial killer. Yeah, uh, spoiler, obviously. He's been warned. <laughs> <laughs> but he starts to profile Sasha because in, uh, there's some things that he's interested in. He wants someone who's rebellious, someone who's headstrong, loyal, and sensuous. Almost, almost, almost Emma. What was it? Since uh, headstrong. <laughs> Rebellious, headstrong girl. I can't remember. Oh, from Jane Austen. <laughs> from Jane Austen. But yeah, he wants a Jane Austen character. He wants a Jane Austen heroine. And Sasha is becoming all of these things. And that's, I feel like that at some point in the book, you can see his attention turn mm -hmm. to her away from business because she's becoming these things. And as you're learning about the other um, victims, that they were basically described as this as well. And now Sasha's becoming this and he wants Sasha next. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think I, I missed that sort of. I was wondering in my memory, it's like, did he want um like a protege? Like he felt something was wrong with her and maybe a, a protege to teach. That's <laughs> to not teach what religion. I remember. He he his um one of his mentees is Caleb. Right. And so I don't, yeah. Caleb I don't is know a character we meet in the next book. We don't mm -hmm. meet him in this book. Um, but yeah, if you're familiar with the series, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, um, which I we're I know we're skipping around a bit, but which brings me to the the notion that Nalini Singh is a pantser, right? Yes, I just listened to the interview she had on Faded Maid's podcast, and there are even before then, even before I listened to it, I made notes. I'm like, I wonder because there were some <laughs> things in this book that came very late. So we don't meet the Lauren family or ever hear about their existence yeah. until chapter 22. Yeah. And that's a thing where I feel like if she had been a plotter, we could have at least had a mention of, hey, there's this family that all died. We, you know, see it in a little earlier because they are a family of Psy who everyone assumes has died because if you leave the Psy net, you die. Mm -hmm. And they turn up with the wolves and they've somehow defected. Um, so I felt like that one was one of the reasons that Sasha can't leave because she has no one, no one to connect. She doesn't have a family. Right. Lawrence are a Psy family, which sounds like an oxymoron. Well, I mean, they do have family bonds, I think. I mean, Nikita is Sasha's mother. And even though there's no maternal love, there Nikita is there, there's the respect. over when she realized she was about to, she was about to go down. Yeah. Yeah. But look, so the Laurens leave the Psynet, the Psynet, you know, the mental internet. They can't live outside of the Psynet. That's the belief. No Psy can live outside of that because they need the mental feedback. So mm -hmm. as a family, they are okay. But Sasha, right, she doesn't have the family. She can't join their family. So she believes if she leaves the Psynet, she's going to die. Mm -hmm. Or when then she learns that she is actually connected to Lucas, but he's not enough. And if she yeah. leaves the Psynet, she'll kill him yeah. just by virtue of existing. Which is really good building of the stakes, which is fantastic yes. for a non plotter to do well i mean you know we're we're both plotters and i think that we have to be careful not to be pejorative about about pantsers we don't want to alienate the audience who might be pantsers True. however i this is i did you know this term pantser during film school no ever, yeah not at I, all 
I'm, you not can't be pants pejorative. a screenplay. You can't. Because, so, I mean, maybe you can. Let me know. <laughs> I, I don't think that you can because you, you're not you're not taught plot versus pants. No, you're, you're taught, taught structure. Plot. Structure. Well, really, even just structure. We were taught structure. You, this right. is how you have to structure. You can then go in and not know exactly what you were going to do, but that that structure had to be there. And I think that I, because I hear people getting to these plotter versus pants or argument. And I'm like, at the end of the day, you're going to have a meet cute. You might not know that you'd had a meet cute, but you had a meet cute. You're going to have fun and games because your hero and heroine, they have to fall in love. They ha- there has to be connective tissue. There's going to be a dark moment. Even if it's like a half second long, there's going to be a dark moment. So I just, I've always been confused when I became a novelist. Like, why are y'all arguing about this? The structure is going to be there in order for readers to enjoy it. Well, I don't know if I can completely agree. Okay. I mean, I do believe that, you know, a plot, a pantser is someone who is intuitive. They're writing intuitively. So they've read enough books. They've watched enough movies that they understand, even if they can't articulate it. Yes. Fun and games, you know, midpoint, dark moment, all of those things generally appear. But I think that there is more experimental fiction and there are definitely books that don't work that where they've missed something big that even their intuition, you know, whether Potter or Pantser probably could do this because you can get it wrong, I think. So absolutely. you can I, absolutely get it wrong. And there are also, you know, different types of storytelling. So we're both American raised on Western storyteller, sure. Western storytelling, sure. other countries, other places, other cultures have, you know, different types of storytelling. Like I read, I cannot remember the name of this novel. I was in a, I was in a writing class. It was a Japanese novel that did not follow the structure that we are used to. And I personally did not enjoy it, but it is, you know, heralded. And I wish I knew what it was. Uh, so there are different ways to tell stories, you know. I wonder if, those, and, if that story, if it was like so many of the other stories that that culture enjoyed. Maybe so. Maybe they have a separate, you know, there are, there, there is a Japanese structure mm-hmm. that, you know, is taught and there's word a word for it. I had a blog post about it a long time ago. And it just, there's, well, there's like no dark moment. They just, they're doing other things. Mm-hmm. So there's possible to enjoy stories that are doing other things, I think. I would agree with that. But I think that, I think where my confusion and my resistance to people saying, well, I... I have no structure. It's like, no, you do. <laughs> you just don't know what you don't know. You don't have the the words for mm-hmm. it, but you do because this is what the masses enjoy and the masses keep coming back for it and asking for more of. But that the masses enjoying it doesn't mean that that's what someone's writing, you know? But commercial success. So you're only, you're talking about successful authors who yeah. say that they don't have any structure. So qualify that because you could be an unsuccessful author and say you don't have structure and maybe you don't. (laughs) Nalini Singh is a massively successful author who pants her stories, but we can see all the structural underpinnings right there. Even though we, we would have done it or I, I'll take you out of this. I would have done some things differently. I would have seated in the Lawrence. I would have seated in a couple of other things to, Mm -hmm. to strengthen it. She wrote a strong book. But there are places where she could have even made it even stronger if she had gone back and seeded things in. And I think that I think that's what structure allows you to do. Knowing the structure allows mm-hmm. you to do. Even if you don't sit down and outline it first, you still will you can either go back or you can look forward and say, that's what I need. I don't and I think that, you know, I many pantsers do the structure afterwards. So they pants the mm-hmm. first draft and then everything happens in editing, you know, not knowing anything about Nalini's process other than her saying that she kind of pantses it. It is, you know, it's like whether you're structuring it ahead of time or after the fact, after the first or second draft. Yes, I kind of agree with you there. Mm-hmm. But um people have the debate because they feel judged, you know, and I, <laughs> I don't want to judge a pantser because there's wonderful pantsers. Obviously, this book and all of the rest of the books were super important to both of us, you know, even though, yes, I agree. I would have done something. I would have seeded the Lawrence in earlier mm-hmm. um, just so it felt like not coming out of the blue in chapter 22. Mm-hmm. That's just an emotional thing. It kind of took me out a little bit. I'm like, wait, what? I, I almost wanted to go back and search my Kindle. Like, were we? Did I miss a mention? No. Did they? Was it some offhand, you know, thing? Because that was just foreshadowing and, and planting seeds. 
It worked. And it worked anyway. We love the book anyway. So, yeah. But I, I do, you know, I don't want us to go down the road of castigating <laughs> pantsers. No, I'm not going to castigate them. I'm just going to say they have structure. Right. And I don't know. I mean, maybe there are people claiming not to have structure. But, um, yeah, I, I think that intuitively, you know, if, we, if, we've, if we're trying to write commercial fiction and not necessarily, we're not talking about literary. This whole conversation is no. assuming we're talking about commercial genre fiction. Yeah. Then you have structure. You, you probably, you probably do have structure if your book is working and if people, at least in Western culture, are <laughs> responding to it positively. So commercial Western fiction, whether you plot or pants, what you have is a structure. Probably. <laughs> Well, I see, I see some other structure in this pants book when it comes to werewolves. In addition to wanting their mate to smell like them and having a mating dance, there's also that public display of affection, which is the bite mark. That and it's interesting. We don't we don't see it yet in this book, but I but there's there's the notion of a lone wolf, even if you're a cat or a bear. Mm, there's like a, a notion rogue. of the loner, of the rogue. But they always find family in a when they're healthy. Romance. Yeah, mm -hmm. when they, I, I think they might have like a loner who, is on the on the path towards health, has to come into some kind of family. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the values of romance. I think the value of romance doesn't necessarily value you're this lone person out here on their own. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you have to come in. We're going to hug you. We're going to keep you warm. And we're going to give know, you skin privileges. Yeah. And you're on your journey, but your journey is always towards family, towards wholeness, towards mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. which is probably another reason why they're so comforting and romance novels are so, you know, they just, regardless of the subgenre, you know, we love them because it, they, they reinforce these values of love and connectedness. They do. And that's why there's also another rule is that the another rule that I think authors should pay attention to if they're writing any type of a shift or romance is that roles get outlined. Connections get outlined. So in this pack, there's a healer. There's an alpha. There are the sentinels. Mm -hmm. And then there are other... Uh, people who get protected. And they talk a lot about the women and children that get protected. I don't really right. know what a man who is not a sentinel does in this pack. And that's that's okay because it was a very tight cast. For this said, we didn't person. meet, we didn't really meet the pack. Um they talk they talk about the maternal females mm -hmm. and then there are the more warrior females. Mm -hmm. And I guess I kind of assumed that I guess I assumed that most of the men would have been warriors, but not necessarily because there's mm -hmm. got to be teachers and mm -hmm. cooks and all the other roles of society. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we don't we don't know any of that at this point. Not at that at this point, but there's they usually are clearly defined, and I think she's doing that. And because again, this is the first book, she's not trying to overload us. Thank you very much. Yes, but there those roles were very clearly defined. Even in the sci world, the roles were very clearly defined. The uh, two other rules that I saw too. And this is a paranormal one where there's a there's a claiming mark, but there's also a vocal claiming. So there's like a physical claiming, and there's also the vocal claiming. And nowadays, we the the male will say she's mine. <laughs> right, it always happens, and it's beautiful, and we love it, and we can't get enough of it. And there's also his dominance. I haven't seen my Goodreads will call me a liar if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen a female dominant shifter like a female alpha I, yep um, goodreads is already calling me a lie because ts ts joyce does this, this female joyce alpha has had, yes has had not not yes she's had female alphas but they weren't do you remember um the the trailer park bears yes i think it was the second series of the trailer park bears and there was the willa character mm -hmm. i remember willa got very turned, well. and she was so dominant Yes. Was it Creed? That yes. She, she, she was number two. Yes. She yeah. She took over number two role in the pack. She, she was more dominant than all the guys. And then at some point in one of the books, Creed was like, "You don't understand. She's so dominant. Like I was scared for a minute there when she got mad that she was gonna take my alpha position from me. <laughs> so yeah. And she's and I think I think that T. S. Joyce does this so well because Willa is funny. T. S. Joyce is very funny. Yes. Willa is so funny. 
that yes. you're like, yeah, girl, you can totally boss me around anytime. Right. Yeah. You don't question it at all. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's, that's ho- totally like in line with T.S. Joyce's whole style. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Very irreverent and hilarious. <laughs> But that is my pack rules for authors so far. I will keep adding to this list for you guys. You're welcome. The other thing I wanted to mention, the other thing that I felt like I wish, well, they felt like an afterthought or like a, a kind of a pantsy thing that she discovered and it felt discovered was, the, and maybe not, you know, obviously I have no idea what's going on in her mind, but the fact that when Sasha is able to get out of the sci net and enter the changeling web of stars, that's what she calls it. It's mm-hmm. their version of the net. It's it's only with Lucas and his Sentinels, and it's only because the Sentinels took a blood oath. Yeah. And I felt like it should have been the whole pack. Like, why isn't the whole pack connected? Once you're in the pack, you have this emotional connection. I, I kind of just wished that it was more than just these, I think there's five Sentinels, mm-hmm. and they're the only ones propping, propping them up. Um, but... You know, a, gr- a great thing that this book does is sets up future characters and make you care about them intensely. Mm-hmm. Like I've started wanting Hawk's book. Hawk is the <laughs> alpha of the wolves right here in book one. We don't get it for a while, but and I don't think I long, knew. And well, she it, made it, us wait. She made us wait a long time. I remember that. Yeah. And I was just every time you see Hawk a lot and, you know, um, you see him probably in every book. I can't remember now, but uh, that was great. So you start introducing these characters mm-hmm. and making you care about them, giving you glimpses of their wounds. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we talk about, and you said this to me first, and I don't know where you got it from, but you were talking about story questions. Yes. And how, when, cause you would act like I was, I was having trouble with the book once you were like, well, what's the story question? I was like, what? what's, <laughs> what's the story question? So she starts asking. Tell them what the story question is. <laughs> So there's a goal to to all of these books, right? So if you're writing a mystery, the story question is going to be well, who done it, who killed, who killed whoever. If it's a thriller, it's often like not so much who done it because you figure out who. It's why did they do it? In a romance, it's going to be will they get together, and you know the answer is going to be yes. But then there's sub story questions, right? So this becomes with Lucas, it becomes will will he find the killer? Mm-hmm. Then it becomes with Sasha, will she survive getting out of the net? So there come sub story questions, right, for the subplots. Right. So what I think Sing is doing, and not probably not knowing that she's doing it, is she starts to ask story questions about these characters that she's introducing in you the future. See, yeah. For the future, right? Like you, we we didn't. I don't know that we got. I do not remember reading Kit's book, but you you want to know is he going to become an alpha? Because he's kind yeah. of he's accidentally and sometimes on purpose screwing up. <laughs> you want to know is he going to become an alpha in the second book with Vaughn? you see that Vaughn is the only pack member that is standoffish of Sasha. He's like, nope, I don't want you in my head. I don't need, we don't need skin privileges. Like he barely gives her some skin privileges at the end of the book. And that starts to ask the question of why are you like this? What, what is your wound at past? She starts to just ask the questions and leaves them until we get to their books. And that is, that is all you really need to do. You mm. again, you don't need to bog us down. Mm-hmm. Just ask the question. And it's brilliant. Cause yeah, that you're right. I didn't think think about Vaughn. Vaughn is a mystery that she sell, um sets up. Hawk is kind of a mystery. Judd is kind of a mystery. Mm-hmm. Like you meet yeah. these people, you get little glimpses of something wound like about them, asking the questions. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good point. Um the other thing when you were talking about the pack and stuff was that. There is not a ton of action in this book. There's no <laughs> fighting in animal form. You're thinking shifters, jaws, paws, claws. There's no fights. It's, it's the emotional. Touch. It's what? It's about the touch. Right. It's emotional and internal. And the main conflict is a romance conflict. It's how are they going to be together? The, the serial killer is a subplot <laughs> to this. <laughs> so much so that he gets caught off screen. We don't see any of it off the page. She is not concerned with seeing us, no. having the reader watch this plot mm-hmm. that was so important to Lucas. He's not even there, no. right? Like Lucas doesn't even show up. He's with Sasha. It doesn't and it's like, anymore. Yeah. It's, it's about the love story. So paranormal romance can go in a lot of different directions, depending on what the author is most concerned with. I know in mine, I'm very concerned about the external plot. <laughs> so it's like, you're going to see all that on the page. But I appreciate that for her it's just are the it's the story question is primary are they getting together how are they getting together how are they getting together and And act three is that is how is how did how is this going to work out and i think Mm -hmm. that's i that is a really interesting question because i think that 
one of the things that romance readers and we were talking about this not too long ago like how people are like not wanting really tough dark moments how they're wanting things to be much more lighter these days yeah, yeah these days these days and i think that has to do with it they just want to see the internal emotional love evolution they don't care about the 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 the, the conflicts how yeah. will they evolve life is hard and i think the, <laughs> the, the rise the rise of things like cozy fantasy mm -hmm. and you know it's just low stakes you might have any number of creatures you know you've got literature and lattes which just blew up about an orc about after she stopped fighting so yeah she was a, a warrior orc and now she just wants to open a coffee shop mm -hmm. like we don't care about the, the fighting and the wars and everything it says the conflict is how does she start her coffee shop and yeah that's interesting because we went from like early bodice rippers of there being so much force mm -hmm. to the contemporary romances of there being like a lot of big misunderstandings. And these are all my interpretations of, of the history of romance in like 10 seconds. And and then we came into the paranormal romance in the in the late 90s. Now, Lini Singh thought she was at the end of the paranormal romance craze and she just kind of made it go back up. But with the paranormal romance where it became a lot of internal what was going on? Even the animal is internal. It's inside of them. And now we're moving on where people want less angst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They want less conflict. Yes. And they want us to get to the happier quicker and longer. It's, humans are fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, you hear these books described, these kind of cozier books as it being like a warm hug. Mm -hmm. Or I've seen people looking for book recommendations. It's like, I, I want a book that's going to feel like a warm hug, mm -hmm. not too much conflict. Mm -hmm. And as writers, you, you're learning that story is conflict. But there's conflict in these emotional internal things, too. It's just no swords, no battles. It is a smaller level of conflict that will still hold your interest, but not stress you out. Yeah. And although... I can't quite say that about these because these books, there's darkness, you know, there are serial killers. There's little or darkness. There's a darkness. Yeah. And there's just twisted things that happen and awful things that happen. But at the end of the day, the way that she makes it palatable so that we're not running screaming is that so heavy focus on these internal arcs and, you know, the love story because it's a romance, but also, you know, the, the secondary nature of the external plot, really. Mm. So, any mm. final words about Slave to Sensation? I'm going to wrap up. No, Lucas was one of my favorites, even though I felt like he was pushing a little too hard. <laughs> but then I met Vaughn. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. No, Lucas is hardly pushing at all compared He's to what we'll do with in book two. He's <laughs> a um, No, I'm just I'm excited to, to talk more about Vaughn and to get even deeper. I think we both stopped around Caleb's story. So there is some that I will be reading for the first time. Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, I know I read through Hawk's story. That might have been that one of the maybe the one after what that was. I think I got through book 10 or 11 in the series and and then I faded away. So it will be fun to get there to get to the, the books we haven't read before. And she's still writing. She is in a second season. But um, yeah, so there's lots. There's lots more books to come. So if you are reading along with us, we will be doing Visions of Heat, book two in the series with Vaughn and his heroine. Um, and we'll post a schedule, yes, Faith, so that you will know when to have read that by if you are keeping up with us in this reread or read for the first time if it's new to you. So what's going on in Leslie World that the authors and readers should know about? So currently, as I'm recording this, I am working on the third book in my trilogy, the Bliss Wars series. It's my futuristic dystopian portal fantasy romance with shifters and dragons and the first two books are out, working on revisions for the third one. It comes out next spring. And I'm also prepping for NaNoWriMo, which is coming up as we're recording this soon. So yeah, I've got a lot on my writing plate, but it's all good stuff. It's fun. And yeah, getting ready to do another cohort of my world building course, which is called Imaginary World Building. And where so can if you were, find that? That is at myimaginaryfriends.net which is where you can find my courses and my newsletter for writers, which comes out just about every Monday. What about you, Inez? What's in your What about world? me? I am perpetually running my patient or pacing course, How to Write a Binge-Worthy Novel in 21 Days at inesfrites.com forward slash PTP for patient or pacing. And I don't know what I'm writing. I'm writing books. I can tell you. I have. Right. A, I, I operate on a list. I open up my planner. It tells me I need to write two chapters of a book this book, two chapters of that book, and I do what I'm told. <laughs> and then I, everything else just oozes out the other <laughs> side. 
Because um, you're very prolific. And uh, so by yeah. the time this episode comes out, you'll have you'll be five or six books yeah, away from wherever books you are now. <laughs> but I always remind people, I come from television where we wrote 13 episodes a season. So <laughs> never make I never knew that I was only supposed to write like one to two books a year. So I But your books are a little shorter. If you're writing 130,000 word epics like mine, it might take you a little longer. A little longer. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Maybe a little longer. Maybe. Maybe. But that's what I am up to. And if you are interested in learning how to write a novel, I talk about pacing. I don't talk so much about plotting or pantsing. I talk about the structure and how the structure of books works and how if you study that structure, building up those muscles of of storytelling um, in that sense, how that makes you a stronger writer. And it gets you to write books faster because you know what needs to happen uh, next, whether you write an outline or not. So that's what we have going on in our world. Make sure you join us back in this magical world of ink and magic. We'll talk more about craft, world building, and romance soon. We'll see you next time. And make sure you give us a review and rating in your favorite podcatcher app and subscribe to the Ink and Magic podcast. Bye.